Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down, and they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're going to conclude our series, Peace Be Still, today. And if you recall, we began this series a couple weeks ago, looking at uh, first how to withstand the, the winds of, of life, those rogue winds that, that blow into our lives and, and push us back and, and knock us off track. And then last week, we talked about uh, those desert experiences that we go through in life and how God meets us there, how God sometimes will lead us there, but how God doesn't abandon us there. Tonight, we're going to talk about the waves of life. And we're going to look at a miracle that Jesus performed that is recorded in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. It's this miracle of Jesus walking on the water. Now, why did Jesus perform this miracle? Was it just to to kind of show off? Well, Jesus never did any miracle just to, to show off. In fact, this particular miracle, nobody saw it except the disciples. And so why did he do it? Well, he performed this miracle to teach them and to teach us how to trust him in the storms of life, when those waves are crashing in around us and it feels like we are about to go under. Now, this miracle on the Sea of Galilee happened almost immediately following another miracle. It was the feeding of the 5,000. And so the backstory on this is they had all just left the area where this miracle of, of Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fish took place. And so Jesus sends his disciples out uh, onto a boat and tells them, head towards Bethsaida. And he was going to stay behind and dismiss the crowds. Now, the disciples didn't have to cross the entire Sea of Galilee. Jesus sent them up to Bethsaida. This is just a short trip up the coast of the Sea of Galilee. All they had to do was just stay near the shoreline and row along, and they would have been there in an an hour or two. And so Jesus says, go there. And I'll meet you there, but I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to dismiss the crowds, and I'm going to pray. So let's pick up the story in Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 52. And again, it says immediately. So this is immediately following the feeding of the 5,000, right? This is right after that miracle of the fish and loaves. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him, while he dismissed the crowd and then stayed behind to pray. Now when evening came, the boat with all the disciples in it was out in the middle of the lake. Now let's just pause here for a minute. What are they doing out in the middle of the lake, (laughs) right? All they had to do was row up the shore towards Bethsaida. But now they're out in the middle of the lake, right? They're way off course, miles away in the wrong direction. They're out in the middle of the lake. Jesus is standing on the shore, and he sees them. And now he sees them straining at the oars because the storm has kicked up. If you've ever been uh, to Galilee, you know that out of the Sea of Galilee, storms just kick up at random. They, They just start up. I remember being there a couple years ago. We're out on a boat, and all of a sudden it just started to rain for no reason. So this storm kicks up, but this is not some little shower, right? This is a big one. This is a monsoon. These these are gale force winds that are are blowing against them. And so they're straining at the oars. And then it says about the fourth watch of the night. That's between 3 a.m. 
in 6 a.m., the darkest time of night, Jesus went out to them walking on the water. And he was about to pass them by, but when they saw him on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, right? Because you don't normally see people walking out on the water in the middle of the night in the, in the middle of a storm. They thought he was a ghost. And they cried out because they were terrified. I would be too. <laughs> There's somebody walking out on the water at you. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. And then Jesus climbed into the boat with them and the winds died down. Other gospel accounts tell us that the storm stopped instantly. And they were completely amazed because they didn't understand what just happened with the fishes and the loaves. In other words, they hadn't learned this, this miracle of who Jesus is when he just multiplied fish and bread into feeding 5,000 people. And so their hearts were hardened. So what's going on here? Remember last week we said sometimes Jesus will intentionally send us into the desert. And so here he sends the disciples into a storm. He sent them, right? And he knows there's going to be a storm because he's God. He knows what's going to happen. But there's a lesson of faith that Jesus wants to teach them, and it's a lesson that he wants to teach us as well. It's this lesson about what do we do when the waves of life just start crashing in over our boat and it feels like we are about to sink. Have you ever felt that before? Like you're just in a boat, and all of a sudden the storm kicks in and the waves are crashing in over you, and it feels like you're about to go down, your boat is filling up with water. How do you trust God in those moments? Well, before we look at that, let me share with you a few sure signs that, that you are sinking, that we are sinking. You, you may be sinking relationally. You may be sinking financially. You may be sinking with your health. You may be sinking in, in anything. But these are signs that, that, that you are sinking, that you feel like you're about to go under. Here's the first one, that I, I know I'm sinking when I can't see my way clearly. Right? That's a surefire sign that we are sinking. When I can't see in the dark, when I feel like there's no vision, there's no clarity in my life. John 6, 17 says, by now it was dark. Right? It's completely pitch black around them. Now, today it's almost impossible to go anywhere where it's completely pitch dark black, right? Even out in the country, there's lights. There's cell phone tower lights. There's house lights, street lights. There's some kind of light, the moonlight. But 2,000 years ago, on the Sea of Galilee, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, it's pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. And you soon begin to feel like you've lost your way. That's a sign that you may be sinking. You, you can't see clearly. You've lost your vision. Here's a second sign that you may be sinking is that you feel like you're all alone. Right? I feel like I'm completely on my own here. I feel I, I'm out rowing in the storm by myself. Nobody's helping me. God's not around. I, I, I'm all by myself. John 6, 17 says Jesus had not yet joined them. In other words, they're out on their own. They were away from Christ. And we tend to get in trouble when we are away from Christ, don't we? The disciples were sent to Bethsaida, but on their own. They felt all alone. And when we feel like we are all alone... We start getting frightened, and we begin to think like we are going under. Here's a third sign that I may be sinking is that I'm out of my comfort zone, right? I feel a little unsure. I feel a little insecure. And that's what happened to the disciples. They're out in the middle of this lake on their own, and now they're way out of their comfort zone. They're as far away from shore as they can get. That's what the middle of the lake is, right? And so they can't just get out and swim. <laughs> There's a storm. They're way off course. They're way out of their comfort zone. You ever felt that way? 
Like you've just been blown way off course from where you thought you were going, and now it feels like you're completely out of your comfort zone here. That's a sign that we may be sinking. Here's a fourth sign that we may be sinking is that these strong waves start to batter against me. Matthew 14, 24 tells us the disciples were tossed around by the waves. Mark 6, 48 says the wind was against them. John 6, 18 says the waters grew rough. This is a big storm. And in the original Greek, that, that word rough, where the waters grew rough, it's the word megas. It's where we get the word mega from. Right? Like mega millions or, or megatron or mega whatever. It's huge. So this wasn't some little spring storm. This was, this was a hurricane. And they were caught in this mega storm. Ever felt like you were caught in a mega storm? Like it's just too much coming up against you? Maybe you feel that way tonight. Maybe because of a strained relationship, maybe because of the economy, maybe uh, the bills, the kids, the grandkids, work, and you're tired, and you're worried, and you can't sleep. Well, chances are there's strong waves battering up against you. A fifth sign that we may be sinking is that we struggle to stay afloat. We just struggle to stay afloat, right? We try. Like, I'm trying, I do, I'm doing all I can do, I'm giving it everything I've got, but I'm failing. I'm doing my best to stay above water, but, but it just feels like I'm sinking, right? I'm rowing, but I'm not going anywhere. Mark 6.48 says they were in serious trouble, right? This was a serious situation. They were rowing hard, but they weren't going anywhere. They were struggling. And maybe you feel that way. Many people feel that way today. Like, I'm struggling. I'm just, I'm trying to come out of this pandemic and just get back to some normalcy, but it feels like we're getting nowhere, right? Or, or I've been in debt, and I'm trying to get out, but it feels like I'm falling farther into debt. Or uh, I'm trying to make this thing work with this family member, but uh, it's a struggle, and we're just not getting anywhere, right? You're rowing, but you're not making any progress. Those are all signs that we are sinking. So what does God want us to do when we get in those situations? More importantly, what does God do when we get into those situations? And, and let me just say, I, I don't know what kind of storm you're going through. I have no doubt that most, if not all of us here, are going through some kind of storm where it feels like we're sinking and what typically tends to happen when we go through those storms is we think, well, God's forgotten me. He's, he's left me here, right? He's abandoned me. The God's just a million miles away. He's not doing anything about it because if he would or was, he would, right? God can do anything. But I'm not experiencing smooth sailing. I'm out in this storm. The, see, the thing is, every time you go through a storm like this, every time the waves are battering against your boat, Jesus is there. He's there. And he's doing four things, and we find all four of these in this story. Here's the first one. Every time I go through a storm and I'm facing these waves crashing against me, Jesus is praying for me. He's praying for me before it even happens, before that storm even hits. Christ is praying. We see that in Matthew 14, 23. As the disciples headed out towards the lake, Jesus was praying for them. He's on the mountain praying. He knows what's coming. And yes, he told them to get into the boat. And yes, he knew the storm was coming. But he wanted to teach them a, a lesson that they could only learn by going through this storm. And so as they head out, he begins to pray. This is one of the great lessons of Job. In the book of Job, Job had done nothing wrong. But over a period of just a couple days, he lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. 
He lost his income. He lost his reputation. He lost it all in just a couple days, and he had no idea what was going on. He hadn't done anything wrong. The Bible tells us Job was a righteous man. He wasn't some wicked, evil person, but the worst thing that could possibly happen to him happened to him. To the point that Job said, God has blocked my way and plunged my path into darkness. You ever feel like that? God has blocked my way. I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to get a, a, a good grip on things, but God's blocked my way. I'm trying to get a better job, but God has blocked my way. I have this dream I've been hoping to accomplish, but God has blocked my way. Ever feel like that? Well, friends, let me just say that, that whatever storm we go through in life, we may never understand them. Here on earth, we may never understand them until we get to heaven because God doesn't explain everything that happens to our lives. He just wants us to live by faith. He wants us to trust him. And we can spend all of our time asking why, but we may never get an answer why. But we can know this, that before it even happens, Jesus is praying for us. The night before he went to the cross, Jesus is gathered with his disciples. And Peter says to him, Lord, I would die for you. Now, Jesus loves Peter. And he knows what's about to happen the next morning. So he says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before tomorrow morning. But I've already prayed for you. I've prayed for you that you won't lose your faith, Luke twenty two thirty two. Jesus says, Peter, I have what? I've prayed for you. Before the storm even happens, Jesus is praying for Peter. And he prays for us as well. And the second thing that Jesus does when we head into a storm is he notices our struggle. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. He prays for you before it happens And he notices your struggle when it happens. Mark 6, 48 tells us Jesus saw the disciples straining, right? They're trying to move, but they're getting nowhere. The waves are battering against them, but Jesus saw them. He saw them straining, and friends, he sees you straining. He sees your struggle. But see, the thing is, sometimes we forget that. We forget that God sees us. The disciples forgot. They were unaware, right? They just left Jesus on. Where was he going to go? He's on the shore. They forgot he was there. And so they became afraid. And we tend to do that. When we tend to to think that, that God isn't paying attention, we become afraid. But God pays attention. To every single detail of our lives. God knows when you are upset because you just got that phone call that's just scared you to death. He knows our emotions. The Bible said he has numbered every hair on our heads. That he knows every detail of our lives. Job 31 verse 4. Job says, God sees everything I do. He knows every detail of our lives, including the struggles. And not only does he see it, He sympathizes with it. Hebrews 4.14 tells us that. Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. And we think, how on earth can Jesus sympathize with this storm that I'm going through? It's because he went through them all. He knows. He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be frustrated. He knows what it's like to be criticized. He knows what it's like to be put down. He knows what it's like to be in the dark, in a tomb. And so when we talk to God about this storm we're going through, it's not like he says, well, wow, (laughs) I don't know anything about that one. He knows because he's been there. Now, the third thing that Jesus does when we go through a storm is that he comes to us. At that moment of desperation, he comes to us. At that very moment, we are ready to give up. 
He comes to us. Mark 6, 48, about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Now that verse, just that one verse, is filled with so much truth. First it says the fourth watch. That's between three and six in the morning. The darkest part of night. These guys are exhausted. Right? They've been fighting this storm now for nine hours. They left after the, the meal. And now it's between three and six in the morning. And, and remember, Beth Seda was just a, a hour up the shoreline. All they had to do was get in the boat and row. But now it's nine hours later. They're way off course. Sometimes storms come to our, into our lives, and before we know it, we are blown way off course. Maybe you've had that happen to you. And you say, you know, I had no intention of being where I am in my job, but here I am. I'm here. I've been blown way off course by things I can't control. I had no intention of having this health problem at this point in my life, but here I am, blown way off course by this storm. Maybe, maybe a storm has come into your life and you're thinking, I should have been in Bethsaida by now. But here it is nine hours later, and not only am I not there, I'm miles out into sea, and I'm, it's dark, and I'm all alone, and the waves are crashing up against my boat, and I'm scared to death. And now you've given up hope of ever getting to Bethsaida. Now you just want to get back to shore, but you can't even do that. You've been rowing for nine hours. And you're just ready to give up. And, and, and maybe you felt that in life. Like your life isn't getting calmer, it's getting wilder, right? The storm won't go away. It's getting more stressful. We start to give up on that original goal. What do we do? What does Jesus do in that moment of desperation? The fourth watch of the night, he went out to them. He didn't yell, guys, come over this way. He went out to them. It's at that point of desperation, Jesus comes to us. And, and I love that he didn't just stand on the shoreline shouting instructions to them that they weren't even going to hear anyhow because it's, it's not advice that we need. We need help. We need God to come out to us. And that's what Jesus did. He went to them. Right where they were. He intervened in their storm. And friends, that's the gospel. That we don't have a God that just stands on the shoreline shouting instructions for us, but that he came to us. God incarnate, right? Emmanuel. He comes to us to meet us in our pain and our fear and our desperation. He comes to us in the storm. Christmas is coming up. That's what Christmas is all about. A God who comes to us. Jesus comes walking on the very problem that scares us. He comes walking on the waves, right? He's walking on the white caps. The disciples were afraid these waves were going to kill them. What does Jesus do? He walks on them. The fourth thing, fourth thing Jesus does in the middle of the storm is he reveals his true identity to us. It's here that we learn who Jesus really is. That he's not just some good teacher. That he's not just a guy. He is God. He is God. Mark 6, 49, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost. That word ghost is where we get the word phantom from, right? This is a phantom. But Jesus said to them, take courage. Don't be afraid. It is I. Jesus reveals that he's far more than just a man. He is God. And in this verse, we see three things. He gives them assurance. Take courage. He gives them instruction, don't be afraid. And he gives them revelation. 
it is I. What Jesus actually says there in the Greek is just two words. Ego ima. It is I. Is ego ima. Ego means I. Ima means am. Jesus says, I am. Don't be afraid. What he's actually saying to them when he walks on the water is take courage. Don't be afraid. I am. 17 times in the New Testament, Jesus uses the phrase, I am. I am the bread of life, so I can satisfy all your needs. I am the door, so I can create opportunities for you to go through that you've never even thought of. I am the vine, so your life can be fruitful. I am the truth, so the truth will set you free. I am the good shepherd, so you don't have to be afraid. I am the life and the resurrection. So you don't need to fear death. Egoima, 17 times. Jesus says, I am. And so, friends, if you're in a storm right now, you're, you're out of work, you're in debt, you're, you had a bad health, uh, uh, news come back, you're fearful of the future, you're in pain, we need a Savior. We need Jesus. All the plans in the world weren't going to stop the waves from crashing into the disciples' boat. They needed Christ. They needed a go ima. They needed the I am. Now there's another part of the story, and it's the part where Peter gets out of the boat and walks on the water, but that's a whole nother sermon for another day, right? But there is something about the ending of this storm, something that God wants us to remember to do, and that's to remember to praise him. Remember to praise God in the storm. Don't thank him for the storm, but praise him in the storm. Praise God in the situation, even when you feel like you're sinking, even when you feel scared to death, even when the waves are crashing in over your boat, praise God in the storm. See, we have two options in a storm. We can worry or we can worship. We can't do both. We can't worship while we are worrying. We can't worry when we are worshiping. We can either panic or pray. We can have fear or we can have faith. It's our choice. God says, praise me, worship me. Matthew 14, 32 and 33. Jesus climbed into the boat. The winds died down. John and Mark tell us that the storm stopped instantly. When Jesus climbed into their boat, that storm stopped instantly. The winds calmed down, the waves calmed down, and what did they do? They worshipped him. You may want to circle that. They worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Their whole focus shifted away from worry and being afraid to worshipping the I Am. What storm is scaring you right now? What storm are you going through that's leaving you feel like you're sinking? Why is God leaving you in this storm? It's to say to us, I am. I am all you need. I am the one who can still the storm. I am the one who can quiet the waves. I am the one who can come to you in the ninth hour. I am the one who will come walking on that very thing that scares you. I am. Don't be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Peace. Be still. And know that I am God. As we prepare for communion, I invite you to take a moment to pray with me. And if you're going through a storm tonight, just pray these words with me in your heart. Just say, Jesus, you know those storms that we go through that, that scare us to death. Those storms where we can't see our way, where it's dark where we feel like we're all on our own, where we are way out of our comfort zone. Those storms where we feel like strong forces bashing against me and I'm being tossed about and I'm way off course and I've been struggling for nine hours and I'm not getting anywhere. But Lord, I thank you for praying for me. I thank you for noticing what's going on. I thank you for interceding for me. I thank you that you notice my struggle, that you come to me at that point of desperation, that in the fourth watch, 
you come out walking on those very things that scare me. I thank you that you promised to never abandon me, to leave me as an orphan in the storm, but that you come. Help me to take courage because of who you are, the I am, God Almighty. Help me to not be afraid because of whatever storm I'm in, Lord, the great I am is in my midst. And so help me to praise you in this storm. To not worry, but to worship. To trust you instead of trembling. And to pray instead of panicking. Jesus Christ, we open up our lives completely to you and we thank you for who you are. It is in your name that we pray. Amen.